Greetings and salutations. Yes, it's been a long time since I've posted here on the channel. I figured it was high time to give you guys an update and tell you what was going on. And I got a really good excuse here. What we're going to do is upgrade my file server from Ubuntu 20.04 to Ubuntu 22.04. And we're going to do it from the command line. And I don't intend to pause the video. I'm just going to let it run. So you're going to see what happens as I see it and I'm just gonna sit here and run my mouth while all of this stuff is going on sound like fun grab something to drink and kickbacks cuz here we go now before we do jump into this little word of warning if you're new to Linux if you're new to the channel and you're looking for a how-to guide on how to do this what I'm gonna show you will work but what I'm doing is quick and dirty I mean I am going to skip a lot of steps and one of the big steps I'm going to skip is backing up the data on this machine. It is critically important that you have a, a way to get back to where you were before you attempt to do this because there is a good chance that this machine might brick itself. That's a risk that comes with any upgrade and if that is the case then you may have to reinstall from scratch and if that happens you'll have to have a way to reload all your data so do a backup and actually go find a better uh, tutorial somewhere that's going to <laughs> give you all the little nicety steps in between we're just doing quick and dirty here so if you follow along <clears throat> excuse me you're doing that at your own risk so let's get started let's talk a little bit about the machine that we're working on here this is my file server it runs on the network I access it through SSH that's the secure shell remote login and all this thing does is act as a big file server and there's no software on it at all I access it through SSH and I use SSH tools to move the files around I use things like rsync and uh, you know um, what is the other program that I use um, SFTP secure file transfer protocol which is part of the SSH suite and that's it that's uh, all, it's, all this thing does and the only reason it's here is because uh, about three years ago I decided it would be fun to set up a server like this to have a sort of a test bed it made for a really good video and it's just kept running the machine itself is an old Asus uh, one of those EEE PCs which is a little netbook tiny laptop and it's got a Intel Atom processor in it dual core and two gigabytes of memory this thing will barely run anything with a desktop even the real light desktops like uh, Mate or XFCE so that's one of the reasons I converted it into a server was because it really can't do anything graphically so here we go and this is our victim for today okay so I did put together a cheat sheet I'm gonna put this in the description for this video and so all I gotta do here is highlight and then paste in here which is really gonna make this nice so let's go ahead and clear the screen and to do that I'm going to do control L or you can type in clear either way works great there we go so the first thing we want to do is see what kernel we're running and this is telling me that this is 4.9.0-109 which is the very latest and greatest Linux kernel I installed that earlier this evening so the next thing that we want to do is look at our Ubuntu release and all we got to do is just look at this file so we're going to use cat which is a a little command that doesn't do anything but type text on the screen or send it into a file cat is one of my favorite basic ancient programs in Linux it goes way way back and you can do a lot with it so let's go ahead and just put that in there like that and all I'm doing to uh, paste that in by the way is using the scroll wheel on the mouse is a center button so if I highlight it on one side and then I 
click on it over there, it shows up. So we've got Focal Fossa 20.04, and that's all the information that we need there. Okay, that's good. So the next thing that you're going to want to do is update your system. So we can do that real quick. This, this system should be completely up to date. But let's see what this does. I know somebody out there is going, well, why don't you use your little tool that you wrote called up, which takes care of all this automatically. Uh, I, yeah, I could use that. It'll do exactly what we need to do here, but I figured I would make this generic for everybody. So those of you who know about up and are, and are using it, thank you. Those of you who don't know about up, that is a bash script that I wrote a long time ago to it was a teaching tool to teach people about how functions work and it ended up being something that people actually wanted to use and you can go to easylinux.com and look at the bash scripts page and there's a video up there about up and a place where you can download it and put it on your system it's all right there we'll talk about easy linux a little bit more at the end of the video I got some update info for you guys alright so basically this system right now is very clean and it doesn't need any updates so we are all up to date and good to go this time around let's type in clear does the same thing I know I teach people how to use the terminal all the time and always in demonstration mode so the next thing we want to do is make sure that we don't have any extra packages installed on the system that we don't need and that's what this command will do and I don't think there's going to be any there no so there's nothing installed that doesn't need to be there like old kernels or just anything that we no longer need to use orphaned uh, libraries anything like that so we're good to go and also what I'm gonna do is go ahead and clean the cache and this is additional it's not on the list this is totally optional but what this does is it goes through and any archived uh, packages that we've downloaded that are sitting in the uh, archive for the apt installer which is the package manager for Ubuntu we've just basically cleared that cache out so that just gets rid of extra garbage that we don't need because we certainly do not need packages for Ubuntu 20.04 when we're going to 22.04 so since absolutely positively nothing was updated I'm going to skip this reboot command but we may return to that later so let's make sure this is installed ahead and put that in there now this machine because it has an atom processor is extremely slow so it's already here that's good to know because um, now have I done this on this machine before no yes actually I did I think I did do this from 1804 to 2004 maybe it wasn't this machine it was another one anyway it doesn't matter it's already there so if you get that that's great and you see how it's now set to manually installed if you come across there run it again and that's it that will get rid of that little tag on there that's not exactly sure what that does but essentially it tells the system that you installed this and you want to keep it and it won't put it on the list of orphaned packages should you run into a situation where that package no longer is useful or it doesn't have anything depending on it manually installed package you have to manually remove that's the difference and I don't like to turn that on unless I have a really good reason anyway sorry we digress uh, so let's talk about this computer we're working on just a second here before we get it started and it, it's a it's a very small little netbook PC it's an, one of those old um, Asus 
netbook e e e e pcs and it will hardly run a desktop even a really lightweight desktop and it's very slow got an atom processor two core two gigs of memory in it and that's it and so i decided to go ahead and turn it into a server and that made a great video and it's kind of been like an online backup or a place where you can throw files on the network when you need them and that's kind of how I've used it so needless to say I know I said it before if this gets borked up I don't care this is I could turn this off and throw it away and be like oh well teensy's gone okay so we're there let's clear the screen again I think, I think we're getting to the point where we're gonna do the release upgrade the D on the end here we're only doing that because we're about two days out from the official release right so if this video is playing for you well after the official release which should be April the 21st 2022 then don't put a D uh, there's all kinds of options that you can do with that too like one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that when this upgrade tool goes through, if you have any third-party repositories on your computer like Google Chrome or TeamViewer, Spotify, anything like that, it's going to disable them. And I think it'll do PPAs as well. It's just going to disable them. So once you do your upgrade, you have to get back in the system and you have to re-enable those repositories to make sure that they're working properly. All right, let's go. Let's do it. I'm all excited. It's checking for a new Ubuntu release. Oh, goody. <laughs> Let's see what it came up. Is it upgrade tool signature blah blah blah? I guess it found it. I didn't read all of that. Okay, it's reading cache. And we've made sure that's up to date. So let's see. Continue running under SSH. Yes. The, now, we're this is not recommended. What we're going to do? We're we are installing a new version of Ubuntu over the network. They would really like to have you sit down in front of the machine. However, if you're like running a machine that is in the cloud somewhere, like some sort of virtual instance, like Voltaire or Amazon or something like that, some sort of virtual uh, thing in the cloud, then this is the only way you can do it. So we're going to go ahead and do it. We're going to say yes. So I'm going to put the Y in there. Let's see. Let's see what do we got here. To make recovery in case of a failure, an additional SSHD is going to be started at port 1022. If anything goes wrong with the running SSH, you can still connect to the additional one. If you run a firewall you may need uh, okay there's no firewall on this machine as far as I know let's see if we have any issues here because I just never bothered to set it up like I said this thing runs on my network it's behind a hardware firewall anyway I think it's doing it boys and girls I think we're taking off here okay so what are we going to talk about while this is doing its thing just want to make sure it's checking for installed snaps and looking at the snap size requirements for Ubuntu. I have another machine that is a laptop that is running Ubuntu 2004, which I have actually upgraded from 1804 to 2004, and I fully intend to upgrade that machine to 2204 in place exactly the way we're doing it today probably do that tomorrow after I get through putting the radio show in the system because that just sounds like fun if depending on how well this goes so while we're doing this let's talk a little bit about the state of Linux um, a lot of the guys that I used to watch on YouTube have kind of backed off from posting. If you noted that, notice that yourself. Uh, and I watched a video from Sneaky Linux a while back. He pretty much said kind of the way I feel about it is, is that 
Linux has gotten to a place where it's totally plug and play and it just works. I've been running Ubuntu and Linux Mint. I just upgraded the machine I'm recording this video on to Linux Mint 20.3. I don't sorry, I don't remember the code name for that cuz I just upgraded it and went on with life. <laughs> didn't even pay attention I'm kind of out of the loop with it to tell you the truth and it's it's just been so smooth that there's nothing to talk about it doesn't break and on this channel I've pretty much posted everything I know about the Linux operating system so the videos that are up here are still quite useful there's a few that probably should be updated or removed or whatever but I kind of feel the momentum of the you know, like, okay, we had a small network issue with uh, the Wi Fi on this machine we're recording. Hopefully, that didn't mess us up. We'll see what happens. But it just said it reestablished. <laughs> wi Fi issue trashes machine during install while recording video. Yeah, this is cool. This is why they say don't do SSH because if stuff like this happens, <laughs> it'll mess you up. So let's see what this thing does for a little while. Uh, anyway, like I was saying, the momentum that was there probably six, seven years ago when I started doing this really felt like uh, that it was slowing down in the community and I wasn't hearing a lot of the uh, excitement. It was difficult to get people to uh, comment, difficult to get people to have conversations and in the comments and also um, I had an online forum at some point and uh, that online forum it kind of just ground to a halt uh, so we may have completely borked this up boys and girls because it's not doing anything <laughs> Uh, so anyway, I decided to back off from that for a little while and just kind of give it a rest. And um, there was also some other things going on. Um, I've had a fellow who sort of stalks me. And if I post a video he doesn't like, he will kind of do this half-ass attempt at doxing me. He sends out all these weird emails. And the other thing that he does, uh, he's taken to doing, is uh, just basically posting all of my personal information on Pastebin in several places, which is... a uh, kind of a hacker site where they exchange text and so I decided just to stop for a while um, and that saga continues but it's it seems to be on hold haven't had any major issues with that we'll see what happens with this video actually alright and um, so all of that put together I just kinda of decided to stop for a while and concentrate on other stuff I'm still doing the radio show I work I do our daily on air live radio show okay it's running thank god <laughs> I was about ready to freak and uh, I do that every day and I've been helping people through email a lot I've been getting a lot of emails a lot of people go to easylinux.com and send me emails and ask questions and I've had kind of an uptick in that as well and so I try and help people that way and continue to contribute to the community but just uh, haven't done a whole great deal of stuff uh, publicly uh, in the last several months and it's kind of been nice to take a break and just watch what other people do and I've got some ideas coming up I've got, got a few things that I'm kind of cooking on all right it's asking me questions let's see what we get hit do you want to start the upgrade four packages are going to be removed 89 new packages are going to be installed. 574 packages are going to be upgraded. You have to download a total of 552 megabytes. This download will take about two minutes with your connection. So let's go ahead and just start. Let's do it. All right, we're now downloading stuff. Um, what were we, what were we talking about? I can't remember. Working with people, I think that's what I was talking about. Was working with people through email. 
that's been very pleasant. And the other thing, oh yeah, I was going to say I've got some ideas coming up. I have an idea, and you guys can go in the comments and tell me whether you like this or not. I'm thinking about doing a Linux command A to Z series. So basically what it would be is a playlist. And we'd start with commands that start with A and go as far into the alphabet as we can. Useful commands. And each video would be like 10 minutes. And we just take a look at one command and show the basics of how it works and go on. Of course it wouldn't be complete. It would just be stuff that uh, I felt was interesting and maybe we do one of those a week for a while and see how far we get with it. I think that would be kind of a fun thing and it, it would be an interesting playlist to have on the channel and a resource you know, available to people that they could use uh, kind of like just quick how-to's because uh, a lot of the videos that I have people go to and they do, uh, they're looking for how-to information. Well, how do I do this and how do I do that? And the way I have produced videos through the years has been in a way that it's more like a presentation. It's like each video is a show and we're going to talk about things for 20 to 30 minutes and um, maybe taking the other approach would be interesting. So I'd love your feedback on that because... Uh, yeah, I don't want to completely walk away from everything. So we'll see if that if that happens in the future. Like I said, I am doing the radio show, so that would mean that I'd have to work that in. And I think I could do that. I think I can do one video a day. Now, talking about the radio show, the beautiful thing is, is that you can listen yourself. And I will put a link in the description to this video. All you really got to do is go to the radio station's website, b999fm.com, and click Listen Live. You can listen any time of the day or night. Now, this is live radio. It's not like podcasts. It's not on demand. And I am usually on the air 7 to midnight Eastern Time U.S., and so whatever that is for your part of the world, if you click during that period of time, you're going to hear me. If you click some other time, you're going to hear somebody else because it's just a live radio show that I do. So uh, if you want to hear me, you can do that. And no, me saying this does not give me any monetary gain of any kind. The radio station pays me to be a talent for them. And whether you listen or not doesn't mean I get more money in my pocket. Alright. Yeah, it seems to be doing what it's got to do. At some point here, it's going to start asking us about local configurations. And when you get to those, I think the best thing to do is keep the original file as much as possible. That way, when you boot it back up, it's going to be your same system, and any configuration that you put in there is going to be the same. I remember when I set this up, there were certain things that I had to go in and change, like uh, I want the machine to run with the lid down, and I don't want it to go to sleep. And even though it's a server, that I had to go in there and turn that off. So let's hope that that's not going to get written over, because I don't remember how I did that. <laughs> that's been so many years ago. And we want to make sure that SSH works because I read somewhere that uh, SSH RSA is now disabled by default. Ubuntu, huh? Why are you doing that? See, we use R I use RSA to get into um, all of my SSH machines. So that's something I'm going to have to turn on manually now. Gee, thanks. We'll see how that goes. Now, how long this is going to take if you do this is going to depend on your internet connection and it's also going to depend on your speed of your machine, your hardware, how fast is your hard drive, how fast is your processor. This machine that we're doing this on has a, a spinner. I mean, and we're talking about, what is it? It's not a 7 
720 RPM. It's it's the lower one. It's <laughs> it's just a basic cheap laptop hard drive in here and the processor of course is that two core atom which is relatively slow so it, you if you have a really fast system and you do this it might it might be done by now so anyhow uh, like i said i was talking about linux kind of getting to a place where it was plug and play that seems to be where we're at and those who need it just plug it in wherever they need it and it works for them I still would like to see more concentration on the desktop but it almost seems like that a portion of the Linux community said that oh if the average person wants to use Linux they can just get a Chromebook and they've kinda of given up and walking away walked away from that idea and I'm not completely over that I think the Linux desktop is very useful and I think there's a lot of people out there that are currently using Windows or Mac for their day-to-day -day stuff that could get along fine with Linux if they just take the time to learn and they've made it so easy to use now it's like I said point and click and plug and play it's not like you know Linux has this reputation of being cryptic like oh you have to go to a command line and you've got to put a command in to make it work and oh my god and you'll ever never ever ever have to do that with Windows and guess what Windows I have a Windows machine sitting next to the machine I'm recording this on I've had to go into the command line on Windows a couple of times to fix some problems now I have to be honest I didn't know what I was doing my uh, boss at the radio station was on the phone going okay you put this in there and then you okay because I'm not a Windows expert anymore. Used to be. And, but after Windows 7, I stopped using it. So this Windows 10 machine that's sitting next to me, yeah, I can make it work, but I'm not an expert. And if it breaks, I I call my boss. And I go, how do I fix this? And uh, that is my <laughs> extent to using Windows 10. And my Windows 10 machine, by the way, folks, is actually not even mine it's the radio stations they sent it to me and so it sits here on the desk and it's how I actually do my show every day on the radio because I'm actually physically 250 miles away from the radio station but modern technology is allowing me to log in to the server at the radio station and of course like everything else uh, the radio station is run by a robot these days and so I just communicate with the robot. I record whatever I gotta do and throw it in the system and then the robot plays it at the appropriate time. Okay, so we have a question. Configuration file systemdlogin.conf. It's been modified by you or by a script since installation probably and uh, let's see it shipped an updated version so what we're going to do here is we're gonna keep my version So if I do no, it keeps your currently installed version You're in there. Go for it. All right. That's probably going to ask us questions like that a lot as we roll along here. So, yes, so that's how I do my job is I log into the system. I, I go through a VPN, and uh, this machine thinks it's on the local network at the radio station, and all of the software integrates nicely with the the audio server that's running there and I, I do more than just do the radio show I also record a lot of commercials for the radio station and I do them right here and just pull, punch them right into the server they give me all the numbers and information and I just put them in there and boom they play and the other thing that I do is I maintain the music library. Um, I have gone through this 8,000 song library and made sure that every song that we play is a really clean version. So I, I hoard music. So a lot of it is my own personal collection CDs that I have ripped into the system. Uh, a couple of songs are actually from 
records, 45s that I have. And then I also have access to uh, music services for radio out of Nashville, since this is a country station. And I can download uh, wave files of new music and some old music as well and super clean. And I just take those files and check the levels and set the cues and put them in the system and occasionally do a little editing on a song. I try not to do that. A lot of radio stations these days, they cut the fronts and ends off of songs to make things sound tight, and I, I kind of hate that. About 20 years ago, there was a lot of research done about that, and I was privy to it. And one of the things that people didn't like at that time, and I think it will hold true now, is um, when they do that and they cut up a song. And so I try to avoid that, which makes us sound, I think we sound really smooth right now because with these systems you can very tightly set when the next event plays so if a song is fading out I can say right here is when I want the next thing to play like a jingle or whatever and get things very tight and uh, but not too tight and it sounds good so that's been actually a lot of fun it's been kind of a love-hate thing because when I first started out it was overwhelming I was like I'm gonna have to update all of this music and I just started at the beginning and kept going ended up putting in about 800 songs from my own personal library and I honestly lost count about how many other songs that I either downloaded or whatever and uh, the main problem was with what they had in the system was that it had been dubbed in through old analog boards that weren't extremely well maintained so you had hiss, noise. Sometimes they would have other audio sources playing in another channel on these old boards and it would actually bleed in. You could hear it over the music. It was crazy. And they, they were playing this on the air before I got there. And that's one of the reasons I... They, they were having problems with the system not catching cues. And it was very very weird problems. And I said, look, I think the only way around this is to redub this library. And that just gave me the opportunity to dig through my own stuff and make sure that the had the cleanest, most original copy of everything. So if you're a, if you're a fan of country music, I think you might like the way the way this radio station sounds. I, I do. That's certainly sure for sure. Even on the stream, we got a good sound and stream. So it's b ninety nine nine fm dot com. Link in the description. All right, we are unpacking our new operating system. So, yeah, any time that it's going to prompt you for whether you want to install a new version of the config file or keep your old one, keep your old one. That's a good rule of thumb. The, that's been the Linux Mint philosophy on upgrading for years, is that if you if you see that come up, just say yes you know we don't really see that that much with ubuntu anymore that used to be something that was more common in uh, versions past where it would stop and ask you that and i think i have probably not gotten a message like that from ubuntu in two years in 2004 where it asks me if i want to upgrade something so obviously they've gotten to a place where they can program this without needing to do that as often as often as they used to as you can see here uh, boys and girls when you do these upgrades there's a lot of, you're, you're essentially changing out the entire operating system and if anything goes wrong <laughs> this is why you have a problem it's just all it takes is one of these packages not to be installed properly and then your upgrade fails. Honestly though, as I said earlier, I've done this on a lot of machines. I maintain a bunch of Ubuntu machines. I maintain one for my mom and I maintain another one. Um, I've just upgraded from 1804 to 2004 in place, fixed any bugaboos and kept going. 
and I have found that to be actually the the easiest way to do it up until a few years ago I was mister oh we have a new version let me back up all the data and reload the system and I would start from scratch which arguably is probably a better way to go because then you get rid of all the fluff and the whatever that's left over from uh, the system running for as long as it has but I have found that with Linux even though it may have some of that old stuff in there it doesn't seem to matter it doesn't slow the system down at least for what I'm doing with it I mean if you're doing high performance stuff that might be an issue that you want to deal with or you're doing virtual machines online and servers and you're trying to keep them as lean and mean as possible yeah, I could see that being a problem. The only downside to what we're looking at here is the fact that we have no progress bar because it's not telling us where we're at. And there's numbers there. But there's no way we're just on package 40. <laughs> just, it's not possible. Hey, but I said I wasn't going to stop the video, right? So, what are we going to talk about, man? I would like to say thank you to everybody who has contacted me over the last few months that I haven't been posting on YouTube. And I've had some pretty nice conversations with people and been a little bit surprised at how many folks are switching over to Linux. There seems to be a steady stream of people who are sticking their toe in the water and checking out the Linux operating system and I think that's really cool. Now whether that uh, is enough to constitute a movement or a tipping point, I don't know. I, I stopped looking for that a long time ago. I've kind of come to the conclusion that Linux is something that is always going to be there if you need it, but it might not necessarily ever become totally mainstream. I don't think it's going to take over from what Microsoft is doing or what Mac is doing. But I, I think we're getting to a place where programming itself is getting away from operating system dependence. In other words, a lot of stuff will run on everything or runs in the cloud anyway and doesn't need to be tied to whatever operating system you happen to be running on your machine. You can do more and more with a computer without actually having big sophisticated software installed locally on your machine. Now if you're a creator and let's say you edit video uh, then you're going to need to do that. Or if you're a graphic artist, you're going to have to have graphic software on your machine. You, you know, regular people can do it with a cloud-based tool. Like, for instance, I'm an idiot, and I don't know how to use graphic software. And I, at one point in time, I used to have GIMP installed on my machines, but I never knew how to use it. So I finally gave up on that. I don't even think I have GIMP installed anymore. I don't even mess with it. And I have found that there are some online sites that you can go to. Like if you want to create a collage of pictures, there's sites that do that for you. Now, it's probably terribly insecure and they're you know taking a peek at all your personal information or something like that. But I've never had a problem with it. And... I might need to do like a collage or something like that once in a blue moon as it is. And so therefore, it, it really doesn't bug me. It's like, how often do I do that? Maybe once a year, if that. So I'll just use the online tool. And I used to be very militant about that, you know, about not using online tools and things like that, but... I've mellowed in my old age. Now I'm now I'm more kind of like a pragmatist. It's like, hey, whatever it takes to get it done, get it done. You don't have to do it a certain way. You just need to be able to get the job done. That's it. 
And once you think you've got it all figured out, you got it all dialed in and nailed, oh, this is how we're going to do this, then what you have is uh, usually that's when things change. <laughs> it's like, oh, now i got to figure out another way to do this. Because they stop supporting the piece of software that you use or something like that. And that's any platform, Linux, Windows, Mac, whatever. I have this tiny little piece of software which I've talked about in videos. It's called MP3 Gain. And if you have a really large collection of MP3s, it's very useful. What it does is it goes through your MP3s and it changes the playback gain. It doesn't resample it or change the audio. It just uh, ticks a little configuration bit that's on every frame of audio in an MP3 file and it sets a playback volume. That's all it does. Nifty little program. And I constantly have to chase it around. I have several deb packages that were compiled by Wimpy, Martin Wimpress, for those of you who know who he is. And then he stopped playing with it so much because it became a snap in Ubuntu. I don't think it's available as a flat pack, but it is available as a snap. And I'm, I'm just hoping that those uh, self-contained deb packages that Wimpy made are going to continue to work with future releases of Ubuntu. If they don't, I'm probably going to be going to GitHub and I'm probably going to be figuring out how to compile this thing for myself and I'll start maintaining it. Because I need that. My digital music collection is all in MP3, high bit rate, and I started doing that back in 2000. And so at this point, I have probably about 50,000 songs on my machine. And yes, they were all obtained legally, mostly. And so I need to be able to maintain this library because, boy, it comes in handy. A high bit rate MP3, we're talking about 192 and above if it's really well encoded. You can get away with putting that on the radio. And... 99.9% .9 of the people listening are not going to be able to notice the difference. Uh, so it comes in handy to have that. And that's one little... Everything else I can, I, can, I, I can figure out some other way to do what I need to do. But that particular piece of software, i got to have it. The way I do the radio station, by the way, the music in the radio station, is there's a... I guess you would call it a, a pecking order. Is that the right way to say that? Or I don't know. Uh, having a little brain fart there and can't quite figure out what I'm talking about. But when I'm going to put a song in the system, I would prefer to have it from a CD. Believe it or not, that's what I want first before I do WAV file or anything else because... If it's from a CD, then I can rip it straight into the system, uh, and I use uh, Adobe Audition to process this. And then the Adobe Audition I have has special plugins that allow me to export directly into the automation system. I can set all the cues and things there. Uh, I would like to use the CD first because uh, that way uh, it just seems to be the cleanest most original way to do it, right? And then the next thing down would be a WAV file from one of the aforementioned radio music service sites. They tend to be okay quality-wise, but the problem is is that they like they chop the ends off of things like the fades and whatnot, so you have to kind of go in and doctor that, and that's just because they want to have the smallest file possible. They don't want to upload any silence. And rarely there's a quality issue there and then if I can't get the CD and if I can't get the WAV file the next thing would be to find an mp3 somewhere to put in the system and if it's long as it's high bit rate like I said 192, 256, 320 it, it, it'll be alright it works out okay. Some people are really freaky about that. Like, you can't play an MP3 on the radio. Yes, you can. 
as long as it's decent, it's okay. Now, 128 kilobit, forget it. We're not doing that stuff. And then, I guess below that would be <laughs> streaming the audio off of YouTube. When I first started doing this, they had done that a lot for new music. They just went and found a video on YouTube that somebody posted or the record company put up and streamed the audio off of it. And I don't think they quite understood about making sure that you have the high bitrate YouTube video playing. You know, Don't leave it in auto, but actually try and get like the HD version if you're going to do something like that. And so some of that stuff sounded awful. And so I don't do that. I just don't. Um, it's been a couple of occasions where that's the only choice I've had, though, because I couldn't find the record anywhere else. Don't tell the boss that, though. He, he's like, don't put anything in from YouTube. I want it to be as clean as possible. I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it. But when I do it, I usually do it from an HD upload, and I stream it directly into Audacity digitally. So I'm not losing a whole bunch in the transfer, not doing anything to it. Then I usually turn it into a FLAC file and move that over to the Windows machine and do the final editing over there. My Windows machine and the Linux machines don't see each other on the network. Don't talk to each other at all. So um, they don't uh, have anything to do with one another. The only way that I can exchange data back and forth is either to, to uh, well, I do have a, a cloud service uh, through the radio station that I can put files up and see it on the other machine. I, I actually rarely use it because you know what I do? I've just got a uh, thumb drive plugged into the Windows machine. I unplug it from that, plug it into the Linux machine, get whatever I need, put it on the thumb drive, plug it back in. As a matter of fact, I have the entire Windows machine backed up on said thumb drive. It's a big one. It's like a 256 and 256 gigabyte thumb drive. So it's all on there. So when I get ready to send this machine back, like if they finally piss me off to the point where I just quit, <laughs> then what I will do is uh, just unplug that drive and send them back their machine because all of my personal data is on that drive. And it is backed up in other places as well. Some of the stuff, like the, the music that I ripped for the library, I have that stashed away. So, But really, honestly, I don't have anything that I want to keep long-term from the radio job anyway, so no problem. That's like one of those things where I've, you know, I was talking about kind of just mellowing in your old age. I don't think I would have ever done that like 10 years ago. I think 10 years ago I wouldn't have felt like that was right unless those machines were talking to each other and I had set up Samba and maybe even like had a file server running so that the uh, Linux machines and the Windows machines could have a place to put the... No, I, I ain't fooling with that no mo. <laughs> I ain't got time for it. I ain't doing it. Nope. Quick and dirty. Sneaker net works fine with me. Some people feel like that if you're using sneaker net you're doing something very wrong like nope works great for me hell I miss floppies <laughs> oh several years ago I had this job um, at a radio station and I was the uh, operations manager and uh, I used to have to program music for a couple of the radio stations and so on the, the music computer that had the music scheduling software on it, what I would do is, is generate these log files, and then I would put them on a floppy disk. And I would get up and walk out of my office, make a left turn, go down the hall probably about 10 feet, go through a door, and I was in the rack room where all the computers were. And I would physically plug this in, you know, take a floppy disk and stick it in one of these machines and that's how I would import the logs into the system and I did that every other day you know and of course nowadays can, kids today don't understand computing like that, you know they don't live in that reality 
everything's cloud based. Well, it's all up in the cloud. It's I got it up here. It's I don't even have to think. You know, they have Chromebooks. They don't even have storage. They don't care. There's no local storage, and they don't care. Okay, now we're doing Grub. And we just updated Grub. And I see the new kernel is in there, so we're going to be on 5.15.0-25 once this thing comes up. It has the two older kernels installed as well. That's going to be interesting. Yep, sneaker net, boys and girls. Look that up. In radio stations, there is a this concept of having the on-air computers that actually run the automation systems and the servers that are associated with them, the switches and whatnot, that are not on the internet. Okay, so we're going to keep... A B won't do it, but an N will. We're going to keep our currently installed version. And yes, we definitely want to do that for SSH config. Because if we write a new SSH config, we might not be able to log back in. The only way we're going to know this has worked is I'm going to reboot it, and then we're going to log back into it, and we're going to see if it comes up. Uh, anyway, like I was saying before I got distracted there, the idea is to keep those machines off of the internet. They do not have internet access. That way people can't hack into them and they can't get messed up. And so there's this big divide between the internet and those machines. Now, when I log into the network now, I have access to those machines, but... I'm not quite sure whether that goes for internet style traffic or not because the only thing that I can really see is the hard drive so it's just data and there's certain places you put things to import stuff into the system and then of course we have the software itself which uses several layers of network security protocol to get into the system and like when I record locally that it goes in there and it's like I'm sitting in the recording studio, the, the on-air studio at the radio station. I get the same software, kind of my, kind of what they're looking at. Um, so it allows me to manipulate the system and put stuff in there. And there are several layers of security on there. There's a VPN and then there's two or three logins you have to go through. and It's crazy, yo. You know, when I first started doing this and I was working with my boss... And he was teaching me how this worked. And we kind of learned a lot of stuff together because he had just bought the radio station when we started this. And it's somebody I've known for years and years and years, very dear friend that I'm working with, which is nice. And so it's not like I'm working for some monolithic company. I know the owner, and I know him well. And uh, anyway, we, we kind of learned together how to set this stuff up. And we put a digital board in the station there's no analog equipment at all so when you actually listen to that stream like if you go to b999fm.com and click listen live when you hear the music it's a digital feed there's no analog anywhere it's all digital the only thing analog in that radio station right now are the microphones and they're plugged into uh, processing that is immediately digitized and injected into the system so it's it's very amazing. And when we first started doing that, I remember shaking my head going, this isn't going to work. This stuff is going to be unreliable. I mean, we're going to have all kinds of issues. You know? We haven't. We've had a few. We've had some connectivity issues, but that had more to do with the crappy Cisco switches we were using before. Uh, they changed over to Ubiquity switches. And we used a more standard protocol for uh, dialing in with a VPN and since we've done that any time day or night that I need to get into the system I, I, it's rock solid before that it was a problem sometimes I couldn't sign in and things like that and 
and uh, that's not a problem anymore. And it's just so stable. It's on the air. Yeah, and of course, it's all UPS, backup power supplies. There's a backup generator on the building. There's a backup generator at the tower. And so we don't really have power outages. It's not something we worry about. We also, with the computers that are in the radio station, I think they're getting, you know, they're going through a UPS. They're going through a lot of surge protecting and a lot of power conditioning going on. So they get really clean power. And that makes a big difference in the performance of your computers, boys and girls. If, if you have a machine that you absolutely want to be sure that it's up on line all the time, then you need to put it on a UPS and you need to do that with a power conditioner. Um, not just a cheap UPS that'll keep it up for a little while should the power go out, but you need to make sure that that machine can run for a good period of time and also uh, have it so that the UPS can automatically shut it down in a graceful way if it has to do so. And we're putting in a new VMware Tools Scripts VMware Network. That's interesting that that's in Ubuntu. I wonder what part of VMware is integrated in Ubuntu. VMware Tools. I guess that would be if you are using this as a hypervisor for a VMware vSphere kind of thing, that those tools are actually in the operating system. But it would seem to me that they would have been provided by VMware. Okay. Now remember, as you watch this thing do its job, we're dealing with a system here that has nothing installed. I never put any software on this thing. The only thing that's running is SSH server. That's all. That's the only thing I care about. Because the only thing I needed it for was just to be able to access it through SSH and use it as a file server and use some very basic network tools. So if your computer has additional software on it, you probably get more prompts and things like that. And with no progress bar, I don't know where we are. So this is kind of fun. We're going to know how long this video is only when we're done with it. <laughs> and I also don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> I have a feeling, I have a good feeling that it will because I've done this before, but it's still at the same time. Who knows, right? And to fulfill this machine's mission, the only thing that it ever has to do is run and let me log into it with SSH. That's it. So even if it screws something up somewhere, I probably won't know it. Now, this is the only Ubuntu server that I actually have anywhere. And I installed it just because, like I said, I, I wanted to get a video out of it, number one. Number two, I wanted to set it up so I would kind of walk myself through it. And number three, I wanted to use it as this file server deal. The web page runs on a, it's a virtual machine in the cloud. I rent some space through Voltaire. And so this is one of their machines. It's running on a server in Dallas. I chose that because it was in the middle of the United States. And that machine runs CentOS, and it's still running 7, which is going to be supported for a good long time. And running a simple website like that, you don't need a lot of infrastructure as it is, so this it works out just fine. So I just kind of go in and update that stuff every now and again. I'm not doing a great deal with Easy Linux these days. It's kind of the what's left over after the other stuff we did with that web page uh, some of you may recall that we used to have a, a an online forum called easy talk ran that for a couple of years and then easy talk just sort of fizzled out people weren't really that interested in it i had a few people that asked about it when it went away but surprisingly not a whole lot a lot of folks didn't 
you know, I didn't get a whole bunch of email from people going, hey, what happened to the forum? I got a few people, but not a whole lot. So that kind of told me where that was at anyway, so we didn't do that anymore. That seems to be kind of the way it has gone in general across the internet, is that when I started doing this in 2000, and when I started posting videos about Linux, Lord, that was 2000 and nine all right so it's been quite some time and then when i started really getting serious about it in 2014 2015 at that point in time there was a lot of audience for like articles that you would write or it was a great deal of conversation a lot of buzz and so it was really fun it, you'd go in there and uh, uh, matt hartley course he put up freedom penguin and i started writing articles for freedom penguin and that was a blast because you'd write these articles and then people would comment on them and and things like that so that was fun while that lasted and uh, we used to have a facebook group for easy linux we used to have a lot of conversation in there and it just all sort of went away people these days are much less apt to comment on something or communicate like People will comment. I'm not saying that they won't, but what will happen is is that you look under it and there's not a whole lot of replies. There's not a great deal of conversation going on. And, and of course, the tone of that conversation has changed. I think people are so sensitive to trolls these days that um, they don't want to get into an argument with somebody, so they just keep their mouth shut. It seems to be the way it is. And if you're a content creator, it's really hard to function in that environment because you can't gauge what's going on. So that's a little bit sad, but it'll it'll morph into something else, and hopefully old dogs like me will learn how to do new tricks and keep engaging on some level somewhere, you know. That's what I'm trying to figure out right now is just what direction I want to go with it. What do we want to do next? Do we go to another platform? Somebody said I ought to do Linux on TikTok. Is anybody doing Linux on TikTok? Because I don't... I just... I have a hard time trying to figure out what I'm going to do with... Uh, I think the limit on TikTok is 10 minutes, or it, it was. And trying to figure you know, little chunks. Stick it on TikTok. Okay, it says warning. OS Prober will not be executed to detect other bootable partitions. Oh, well, good, because we're upgrading. I don't want you to do that anyway. This machine doesn't have any bootable partitions on it other than the one that we're using. I remember when I installed this originally the first time around, that was a problem with. Ubuntu Server 2004. So yeah, I did install 2004 in the beginning of the video. I think I said that I couldn't remember, but yeah, now I do. It was 2004. And um, I wanted to set up my own partition scheme. You know, just something real simple like a first 50 gigabytes be for root and then have a separate home directory for data. And for whatever reason, the installer would not let me do it. It was like kicking it back and it wouldn't work so finally what I ended up doing in the end was just letting the installer automatically partition the drive in the computer because this is the little EEE PC and it just has one hard drive in it so I said let, you know, let it do whatever it wants to do it doesn't matter I just want a running system so I'm wondering if that's something that they dealt with it says let's see it said that packages are going to be removed. Yeah, go ahead and do it. And I don't need the details because I don't know what that's going to be. And I, we'll find out later. If that's your system, you might want to look at the details. Okay, we're going to restart the system. I think this is where we figure this out. Okay. All right, it closed SSH. So we don't have an SSH connection. 
and the command that I use on my local network to get into SSH machines is SSHN. Now what that is for those of you who are not familiar with my videos is uh, it's just an alias and it allows me to put instead of the entire network address it just puts the last two digits so in this case the machine we're working on is 12 SSHN and I'm waiting a little while here because like I said this is a very slow machine it usually takes it 30 seconds to even get to where it will accept SSH so I'm just kinda hanging out let's give it a try see if it's up and running yet Ooh, connection refused this could be good this could be bad we're gonna see what happens here wait another few seconds and do that again Since it said connection refused, that tells me that the machine is up and running. We're in. And it says, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ubuntu 2204 LTS. And we are using kernel 5.15.0.25. So it worked. Our upgrade has worked. And just for the heck of it, let's go and check our... Uh, let's just do this again. See what we get here. Clear that screen. And we'll do that one more time. So there's our kernel. Okay, we're going to do an LSB release here. Take a look and see what's in there. I don't have to do that. Why do I keep doing that? Because you just think you have to and you don't. I'm not used to doing it that way. And that's why, here, put it there. That's what we want. Yes. 2204. It's up. It's running. It's updated. It's good to go for another three years. <laughs> Actually, five years of support. And we're on the latest Ubuntu. Isn't that amazing? Everything seems to work. So there is, like I said, a couple of settings that I'm wondering about here. And that would be whether the... Well, obviously it works because it booted with the lid closed and didn't automatically turn itself off. So that means that... Um, it'll work so well, here's what I want to do let's try this real quick hold on I'm gonna reboot the system and yes you have to use sudo if you're doing this through SSH if you just do that if you just put reboot in it won't do it it'll complain so I'm gonna actually know what I want to do let's do this okay I'm going to do a complete shutdown. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is that machine shut down. I'm going to go over there and turn it on from a cold start and close the lid and see if it comes up. So let's see. Be right back. I'm just over here. Okay, so what I did was, it, uh, by the way, that machine lives under an end table next to the uh, Wi-Fi and switch. <laughs> and it is plugged directly into the network. It's not Wi-Fi. So it's uh, connected with Ethernet, which is why it lives under the table. So what I did was, is I went over there and I turned the, of course, I, I switched the power off. So I just turned it on and closed the lid. And if my configuration file had not cha has been changed, it won't boot up. It'll shut itself back down. So we'll see what it does here. Let's see what we get. Like I said, the boot time on this machine. Yeah, that's the, well, that's the same thing we got before. Wait a couple seconds here. It tells me it's up and running. Uh oh, we 
may have a problem here, boys and girls. That might be something we have to deal with. Let's see. We'll just, just be patient. There it is. Okay. So that just is a slower, it's a slower boot time than it had before. I can tell you that right now. Yes, sir. All right. Because the boot time before was maybe about 30 to 40 seconds, and it feels longer. Of course, everything feels longer when you're doing a video. So what I want to do here is just kind of take a look around. I'm going to use my up utility here. I want to see what it does when it updates. Of course, it should not find anything. But what we're going to see here is our uh, repositories. And there we go. Now, if you do an upgrade, we pulled down technically the development release because this has not been officially uh, released. It will be released Thursday. So by the time you see this, it may be in there. Ooh, look, we have updates, and I just upgraded the system. And we're going to remove those old kernels so let's see what it's it's updating a lot of stuff look at this I just upgraded this system isn't that insane oh by the way what you're seeing on the screen that's from me scrolling the mouse that's weird is that a is that a new deal alright let's 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 go ahead and do this and reboot again This is crazy. Okay. All right. So let's reboot it. And we'll have to wait another minute or two before we get back into it. Let's see if that's uh, scrolling. No, that's only while that's running. It seems to be a problem. I'm scrolling and it's giving, it's scrolling through the history. Bet you didn't know it would do that, boys and girls. That's a hidden feature in the Bash world, is that if you use your scroll, it does your history. Isn't that cool? I don't use that very often, but I actually almost forgot about that being there myself. Hope you don't mind me kind of goofing around here, because this is kind of fun. <laughs> Just to see what it would do. I mean, you'd be doing the same thing, right, if it was your system. Let's see if we can get in now. It's trying. I don't think it's there yet. Yep. Connection refused. Yeah, I, I, I might do this tomorrow with my Ubuntu laptop that Cindy uses. Or I may wait a little while. I really don't want to hand her a glitchy machine. Okay, it's up and running, and there we go. Let me run up again. Why are you doing that again, Joe? Just want to see what I see what it says. Okay, so now that that's running. The following packages were at, automatically installed and are no longer required. Let's remove them. I guess I thought that maybe that wasn't updates before. That's what it was doing, right? It wasn't installing those packages. I think it installed something. Hmm. We'll just let's let's remove that stuff. And yes, I realize that I'm using commands that if you do not know what up is, you've never seen before. It's just a twisted way to do updates on Ubuntu. That's all it is. 
So I just left all this stuff behind. I, all right. I'm not asking. Not asking questions, just doing it. Those would be dependencies that it doesn't need anymore. Uh, in other words, we upgraded a program that needed that dependency and now it doesn't. Those dependencies, though, they would have to be jammy, right? They wouldn't be focal. Yeah, it doesn't say. So we'll just take them off the system. Now we're removing the old kernels. This is basically running an auto remove right now. So if you do, the way I have this set up is is that um, up when you have the remove option on it, it updates the system, installs the new packages. If there's anything that's orphaned, it gets rid of that. Uh, it also does a, a, an auto remove for configuration files, which is a little bit different. So it's a two-step process. You'll see it do that here in a little bit. Per yeah, we're doing that now. We're purging old configuration files. Up is a very cool tool. I'll show you how to get to it here in a minute. If you want to play with it. A little shameless self-promotion at the end of the video. How's that? It's pretty cool, huh? Alrighty then we should be good to go. So now what I want to see is if the machine does what it's supposed to. So I'm opening up another terminal here and I'm going to use a program that I have on the machine called Teensy Sync, which is a script that I wrote. I'll make that another little bigger. Yeah, okay. So Teensy Sync is basically a script that syncs up this machine with this server. And it shouldn't have a whole lot of files to move across because I did this not too long ago, but it'll be enough to see whether this is working the way it's supposed to. So now it's looking for the... Okay, it found it. And it's going to try and sync all this stuff up. There's a few things there. So that seems to be working the way it's supposed to. Wonderful. Um, that's doing what it's supposed to do. It's syncing files from this machine to the machine we just upgraded. So, I mean, that's great. It seems to be working, and for what I need to do, it looks like it's going to be fine. Wonderful. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. We just upgraded that machine. I never stopped the video, not edited anything, and that's what it's done. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. So we can go ahead and let's go ahead and get out of here. And uh, we'll go ahead and shut this server down. So, so no power off. And that's it. Next time I need it, it'll be there and ready to rock and roll. Okay, so let's take just a couple of moments here and talk about easylinux.com. This is still up, it's still running. And if you are watching my old videos and you see tools that I talk about that I have available, it's under Bash Scripts right there. See that? And so with the Bash Scripts here, uh, you can scroll down. We have the BU Backup Tool, CYA, which is a project I worked on with Jeremy O'Connell. At Cyberweb Solutions. Uh, this is up with a video there, an introduction to up, and a couple of other things. P2V, that's a pretty cool little tool. What it does is it takes a, a picture and an audio file and you feed it to it and it will create a video where the video portion is nothing but this picture repeated frame after frame after frame. So you could like create a card 
and then you just get a video that's basically all audio. It's nice for uploading to Facebook, YouTube, when you have audio based stuff and you need to have it in a video format. The Bash script collection has a whole bunch of crap in it. Tweaks and tricks, that's really old. I don't know how useful that still is, but it's there. So you can come over here and do that. And I'll put a link in the description for this video. And that's it. So thank you for watching. Thank you for hanging out with me. I've had a good time doing this. It's been a long time since I've done anything like this. And, uh, uh, you know, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Tell me what you think about the idea about the commands A to Z. That would be really cool if you guys like that. Don't know when I'll start doing those, but uh, might be somewhere down the road a little bit. But anyway, hang out and we'll wait and see what happens. So until we speak again as I end my radio show every night, I'm going to go get me a swell glass of milk here, boys and girls. And I'm wishing you bicycle. <laughs>